Normally on 4th of July you would uh, see a, an elaborate PowerPoint display of lots of quotes and pictures of, of our founding fathers and making a case for the Republic of America, not the, the democracy as it's become, um, and so many things like that. But today we're going to take a little bit different turn. We're going to go a different direction. Uh, I'll post some of those things from last year on the, on the sermon blog, so you can look at those as well if, if you'd like to have that ammunition to, to take with you in the, in the witness arena. But today, I want to take a little different direction. I want to talk about the ultimate freedom, the freedom that was displayed in the video that we just saw, the freedom that you and I, each and every one, know that has relationship with Jesus Christ, that it is something to be celebrated, that you and I are free because of the cross of Christ, because he has genuinely made us free. I want to start by taking on the portion of our Declaration of Independence, though, because it is fitting for the day for us to talk about freedom as an example for us to kind of springboard from. Now, on your outlines and on the screen behind me are the words, and I'll read part of it here this morning. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms, our repeated petitions <clears throat> have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attention to our British brethren, but we have warned them from time to time in their attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarranted jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the, the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here, we have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity and have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and of cons consanguinity, that we must, therefore, acquiesce in necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies of war and peace, Friends, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these colonies are and of right, uh, and of right ought to be free and independent states. They are uh, absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and they are all political. Uh, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And as a free and independent state, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other things, acts and things which independent states may have right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on protection of uh, divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Wow, powerful words. Not all of which I could read so easily. But I have one of the Declaration of Independence on the wall in my office, a full version. And, you know, every time I look at it and, and read portions of it, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that there was a real stand. There was a real stand and there was a trust in God in the inception of America and, and our country to, to, to put our total allegiance in Him and confidence in Him because of the cause of freedom. Now, freedom is a great cause. The true cause of freedom uh, is because and freedom only comes because uh, and through relationship with Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 61 reminds us of the prophetic words that Jesus repeated uh, in the New Testament, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, pro to proclaim freedom for captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, uh, of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. This prophecy that, that uh, Jesus came and fulfilled was the, the idea that there was a freedom beyond what mankind knew. 
that there was this righteous religious law that had taken place and that was instituted upon them that they had to obey in order to have any sort of uh, uh, freedom whatsoever. They offered sacrifices. They, the Old Covenant had lots of rules and regulations that they had to obey in order to be made right before God. And all of these things had led to a, a place where eventually God is saying, I'm tired of your sacrifices. I'm tired of your celebrations and your feasts and your new moons. I just want to be with you. I want to have relationship with you. And the joy of that is that it is fulfilled in this scripture that Jesus came and because of the Spirit of God has set us free from the bondages of sin and religious rules and regulations which could never bring peace. But Jesus did. Freedom's cause is simply freedom. Just freedom itself. Freedom alone is its own cause. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has made you free. And do not yourselves be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. And what does it mean to be bound or to be a slave? You know, when we were kids, we used to play this game and, with my cousins, and one of us would tie the other one up, and we would see how long it would take to get out of the, the, the tying of the knots. And some of them were really tough, you know, and we would learn to tie them harder and harder so that, so that eventually we couldn't get out of the rope. So anybody else play this obnoxious game? Uh, there's a few of you guys who did that. Uh, a few of you that tied your younger siblings up and never let them out. Maybe like me, I don't know. Uh, you can ask Amy about that later on, I suppose. But um, it, was, it was a game, and it was no fun being bound. It was no fun being uh, all bound up to where you couldn't do anything. Uh, being bound up or being in slavery means to be in prison, not able to move about your free will, not to be able to make your own choices or decisions about this or that or anything. You imagine the early in early America, the sin of slavery that, that was in this country was, was such a horrible thing, and it bound people from making their own choices, so much so that even the things that they ate or the things that they, they did or for the freedom to go here and there were restricted, and they, they, had, to, they had to ask somebody who was a, a leader or their boss or, or someone that was graceful toward them in order to give them that sort of freedom. Could you imagine being under such bondage? What a horrible, terrible thing. The enemies of freedom are all around us. And the Bible tells us that the, a couple of the greatest enemies there are. We're going to talk about two of them. But um, I want to take a picture from 1 Chronicles chapter 21. The Bible talks about um, uh, David. And we're going to take a look at David's life and some things that happened to him. The enemy of freedom, 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1. The Bible says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So the Bible tells us that Satan instigated David to take a census of Israel. Well, you might think, well, why is this so bad? Why is this so terrible? Well, if we consider Israel's position at this point, their leader was a guy that God had chosen after God's own heart, the Bible says, and battle after battle had been won because of the incredible blessing that the Lord had done on the entire nation. Enemies ran from Israel, uh, tried to escape, even without Israel pursuing them. The enemy still tried to run. God was good and gracious to Israel. One time Israel didn't even have to fight because the Lord just, they just sat back and watched their enemies destroy each other because God was so graceful toward them. God had caused their enemies to suffer confusion and they began to kill each other. All of these tremendous things had happened because God was leading them. God was directing them but, but, the, but because of the word of the Lord. and The word of the Lord was honored and they did what was pleasing before God and it was a blessing on the whole nation and there was an impact on the whole world because they were obeying God. Now being in that position is really a beautiful position because they didn't really have to worry about anything. God was taking care of them. But all of a sudden, the Bible says, in the middle of all God's blessing, in the middle of all God's solutions and his answers, to Satan incites or, or uh, causes David to want to take a census. Now, why is this so terrible? Well, it's because David is, what he's doing is he's counting his own strength. He has decided that God is not enough and that he needs to take it upon himself to be able to know how much he can afford, how much muscle he has in an army, how many people are actually in his kingdom. I want to talk about two great enemies because of this. First of all, in our story or in our history account here in the Bible, the scripture says that Satan himself incited David. So Satan is a great enemy. Satan himself is an enemy of freedom. It's no wonder Satan wanted to destroy um, Israel. Uh, his purpose is to kill and destroy 
already. Satan wants you destroyed. He wants me destroyed. He wants all of us destroyed. And it is his plan. He wants to destroy America. As we look at the fabric of this country and the things that are happening, it, it's absolutely astounding that, that we are in a, in a place today that we are. Who would have thought, you know, 50 years ago, just 50 years ago, that America would be facing the same moral situations and moral questions that it is today where people don't even know how to use which bathroom that they're going to use, whether they're a male or a female. There's all kinds of issues in America concerning uh, who should marry who and, and who should be allowed to marry who. And, and all of the, the power really has gone away from the church. The church has no power. America is literally a post-Christian nation. Uh, I was so blessed this last week to see between five and 6,000 people gathered gather in Olympia as Shelley went and saw uh, with Franklin Graham and just prayed for our country and and some of the things I heard from pastor friends and from Shelley here as well that that, that he encouraged people to get out and to vote and to vote for people uh, who are at least proclaiming faith in Christ and who are, are Christian leaders and be a leader yourself run for an office on your local school board or do something similar to that be involved in your community as a Christian Become part of it. Satan wants America destroyed. In John 10.10, 10, it tells us that the thief comes only to kill and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, or have it abundantly, which where we get our church name from, John 10.10, 10, Abundant Life Church. It's a good name, amen? amen? But the Bible tells us that Satan is the author of confusion. He's the one that doesn't want you to succeed. He's the one that doesn't want America to succeed with the cause of freedom because... Freedom is a biblical concept. Freedom is a Bible idea. It is deep and rich in its theology. It is written throughout every one of its accounts in history. It is the message of Jesus on the cross. Freedom is the reason for freedom. That Jesus died and came and gave his life so that we could be free. Remember what it was like to be under the bondage of sin? Remember what it was like, maybe some of you that have come to Christ, when you, when you came to Christ and you poured out your life before him and, and all of that yucky stuff got emptied out and, and the joy of the Lord came and flooded your spirit? Remember that experience, that joy that filled your life? Remember it every day as you're a believer and you recognize the fact that God has saved you from the filth of sin, that you are no longer the person that you were. You are a free person. You are a different person. The sky is bluer, the grass is greener because you're following Jesus. It doesn't mean all your problems are going to go away. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But it does mean that you are free. Amen. That there is true freedom. I grew up in church, and as a result of that, uh, some, I took on some of the bad things about church. How many know there's bad things about church? The contemporary church? Yeah, no, not at all. Well, some of the things that I caught up on as a kid and was really important to me at the time, I didn't realize it, but I had become very religious in the way that I had lived my life, and I knew everything about everything and the workings of the church, and I knew how to say things just right. And I, I formed my own sort of Pentecostal religiosity. Rather than we talk about those in the liturgical churches and maybe Catholicism being so liturgical and religious and very this, that, and this other thing, well, I had become very religious in my own way. And the, the fact of the matter is, one day, right here at these altars, many years ago, God got a hold of my life. He smacked me around a little bit, and he said, Hey, Larry, I want to tell you something. You are worth nothing. Your goodness is worth nothing. And all of a sudden, the scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, meant something to me. For it's by grace that I'm saved through faith. That not of myself, it is a gift of God. Not by works or my strength or my ability or my talent or my, my preaching or my teaching or all the things that I memorize or, or all the good works that I can do. Nothing, none of that matters whatsoever. It's only because of the grace of God that makes me free. And I got to tell you, when I realized that, there was a real fountain of joy that began to well up within me. It began to flow out of me because I realized that I don't have to be good enough. I don't have to earn my way. I can't anyway. It's not possible that God loves me just like I am. And the sooner that I swallowed that, it was so much easier to understand the full scope of Scripture, the ideas that were written throughout the Bible. It was by grace that I was saved. Let me tell you, you can be a pastor and preach under that legalistic way and live your whole life that way without ever understanding grace. I was in those shoes. 
until about 15 years ago. There was something that transformed me. I had gone through Bible school. I had done all the things I had to do to get my credentials and my license and do all the things that were important for me as a minister and all the training and all the stuff and all the crazy interviews. I went through all of those things, and one day just God hit me and said, hey, it's not about you. Now, some of you might think that's silly, Pastor. I've always known that. Well, good for you. <laughs> Praise God. What a relief. Since we recognize that the power of freedom and fought the suppressors of that freedom, America initially became a nation that Satan wanted to rise up against. And I believe this. When we read Noah Webster, the founding father of the Declaration of Independence, we learn of America's great quest to honor God, specifically Jesus, through and his freedom. You won't find this much in uh, public school history books, but Jesus is written throughout the writings of our early forefathers, the founders of this nation. This nation was founded upon Christian principles. Even though founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson maybe weren't that vocal about it or somewhat agnostic toward the idea, they still embraced the ideas of Scripture because they were right. And this is, this is riddled throughout our history. America was founded, and that's why America blessed, that's why God blessed her so much. So we broke the hold of Great Britain, we fought in skirmishes and war theaters around the world because of the same theme that we believe, the great cause of freedom, and the overwhelming amount of historical documents, all that I just said, that sometimes the first session of Congress turned into a two and a half hour prayer meeting. I've got the, the, a rendering of it on my wall, where they knelt down, and the first thing they did for two and a half hours was pray. I don't see that being taught in history. It's sad that the idea of America following Jesus is no longer a thing. It's sad, I can say, but it's the world that we live in, friends. The church has got its role, though, to pray for revival from within. The Bible says that judgment begins with the house of God. So God really, I believe, He is desiring and wanting to pour out His Spirit in His church if we will but turn to Him as people. And embrace him with all of our heart. So Satan, Satan loathes this. He hates and despises the idea of freedom. He, he loathes the power of the cross. And, 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 and not too long ago we were talking about in a, in a study group of ours about Islam. And the difference is that we are called to love our enemies. And do, go to the, do good to those who despitefully use us. And, and, and all of the things about Islam seem to be so contrary wise to the ideas of scripture. And and, and the thing, the teachings of Jesus, and to be a Jesus follower, it's, it's just one example of many ideologies in the world system today, of the toilet philosophies of this world that the world is drinking from, that, that is out there. And all of these ideas are contrary to the freedom that is found in the cross. How many times have you to witness to somebody, and, you told, and, and you, they come back with a response similar to this, I don't want to go to church or be a Christian. I don't, want to not, I, want, I don't want to quit my fun. I don't want to stop doing this, or I don't want to stop doing I don't want to stop drinking or carousing. I don't want to stop doing this, or I don't want to stop dating this person. I don't want to get married. I want to live with this person. Uh, I, I, want, I don't want to do this or that, I, because that's why I don't want to. How many have heard those kind of things? People have said them to me many times. I don't want to become a Christian. You people are goody two-shoes. You've heard that, right? But the message of the gospel is that God sets us free from the need for any of those things anyway. The good news of the cross of Christ is that, that Jesus comes and he has something so much bigger than our great plans for our life. We think we have all this fun planned and all this great stuff in mind when the whole time God says, hey, I've got something better. I've got something more freeing because all of those things that you're involved in in life, all of that sin leads to more bondage. It leads to more heavy burdens. It leads to more guilt. It leads to more pain. And the whole time Jesus is saying, stop, I've got freedom for you. That's the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Remember, Satan looks good in all of his advertisements. We're watching a show the other night, me and the boys, and there, there was commercials. And we're kind of spoiled these days with the TiVo thing because usually we fast forward through the commercials. But we had to watch these commercials. It's like, oh, good grief. How many times could they advertise for the little blue pill? 
or this or that. Everything advertised on that television during that commercial was for something to make you happy. You need this house. You need this car. You need this mortgage. You need these credit cards. You need this because it's going to give you joy. And what you see is you see somebody that looks really downtrodden and sad, and all of a sudden they're given a Diet Coke, and they're happy again because they've got a Diet Coke now. Because Coke adds life, and everybody wants to live alive. Coca-Cola. <laughs> All these advertisements are out there yanking your chin, you know, and oh, the, the losing weight ones are my favorite, right? This gal gets on there and she's made, she's made a bunch of these little plastic steps and she's selling them not for $150, not for $149.99, not for $147.99, but for $99.99. You can buy this little plastic step. And if you do this five minutes every day, you're going to lose 20 pounds in two weeks if you just do this. And everybody's got a gimmick, right? Well, yeah, you can go to the front step of your house and do that for nothing. <laughs> Remember, Satan looks good. He looks really good. My aunt, that reminds me years ago, one of my aunts had one of those fat shaker machines. Remember those? It looked like a giant blender with a belt on it. You remember? And it wiggled. <laughs> Shook the fat right off of you. I, some of you guys are dating yourselves, you remember. It looked like an old washing machine, kind of. Satan looks good. Second, Chronicles, Second Corinthians warns us, says, No wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. There's a whole lot of heavy things here in just these couple of verses. The biggest principle, though, of which is glaring us right in the face, is that Satan always looks good. He always looks good. He always looks entertaining. But I want to remind you of something, friends. One day he's getting his. I wonder if all the voices against freedom in America will one day make a movie about the nearly 160,000 Christians that were martyred last year for the cause of Christ in our world. Where's the outcry in the media? Where's the media hype over this? But be encouraged. Every time you've witnessed someone and you sense the enemy destroying their lives and, they, they've, and Satan has pulled them back, every time you've taken a stand for Christ and in the, in the face of diversity in our culture and Satan has spat right back at you, every time the voice of freedom has been mollified by shouts of free speech, every time peaceful picture of freedom has been covered up, every time you've mentioned Jesus or been a witness for him and Satan has stepped in and introduced lewdness or some other thing, Satan's going to pay for friends. Revelation 20.10 says one day he's going to be cast into the lake of fire forever. Scripture tells us that hell was not made for us. It was made for the devil and his angels. It was created specifically for Satan, a destination of eternal torment, separation from, uh, separation from uh, salvation, and, and it is the second death. So one day Satan is getting his. He may look good, he may look right, all the things that he does, and, but it all leads to bondage. Oh, I can just dabble this or I can just do that. And, and the thing of it is, when we come to Christ and we pour out our heart, we say, Jesus, I want you to take my life. And we surrender our life to him. We're living a new life. We're on a different path. We're, we're on a new road. We're going a different direction. Things are changed. Maybe we need to be reminded of that. Satan is a great enemy of freedom. Secondly, our flesh is the enemy of freedom. Ourselves. Our text says that David is the one who commanded the census. Now, what was really wrong with him counting the men, as I said before? Well, he was finding out what his power and his strength and the military might of his nation was, and and maybe something that America does today, but it was not something that God had in mind for as he talked to David. Friends, God doesn't want you to stand in your own strength. He doesn't want me to stand in my own strength. Oh, for the times that I have, many times I've had, I have. And i got to tell you, as I get older, my physical strength seems to be waning. Some of the things that I, w I, I could do back in the day, 
I got up, I had to get up on a roof the other day to help somebody do some stuff. Man, I tell you, by the end of the day, I was dead meat. My son Brandon going up and down the ladder like it was nothing. I'm like, I used to be that way. Uh-huh. I used to be like you. The good thing was at the end of the day, he was tired too. So <laughs> I still got something left. But Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes to the church in Galatia, and the J.B. JB Phillips version is a bit pithier. It says, Dear Idiots of Galatia, uh, but we're not going to read that version. In in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul writes, Oh foolish Galatians, this is from the NIV, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the spirit are you now trying again to attain are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort in other words this was done by the spirit's work the freedom that you experienced in the very beginning was something that God did at salvation when we come and we say God forgive me of my sin take away the burden of my sin and he does that and introduces new life when we feel that joy and that peace because we've surrendered let me tell you salvation is a surrendering to sin It's no longer like it used to be where, hey, stand and pray the simple prayer with me. Repeat after me and you'll have Jesus in your heart. It's not simply that, friends. i got to say, I think we've led a generation astray. God save us, uh, you know, from those kind of ideas. And That was never Billy Graham's intention. I don't think when he kind of uh, introduced that, springboarded off the old Catherine Coleman used to do that back in her day. And and it kind of led to uh, this uh, just repeat after me type of thing. But, but, But salvation is repentance. Salvation is coming to God and saying, God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry that I've been involved in this or that. I'm sorry that I'm living this way. God, I, I'm really sorry, and I, I feel badly about that. I don't want to live this way any longer. Salvation is by repentance. Repentance, and then it's coming to Christ and, and acknowledging that he is Savior, acknowledging that he rose from the grave. Those things are very important. We can't do those things by our human effort. We can't continue to say, well, I'm saved. Now I'm going to maintain my salvation by my human effort. We've got to keep going back to the cross. We've got to keep laying down our life. We've got to keep telling Jesus, Jesus, come, fill me with your spirit today. I need you. That's why the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. They're not just for today on Sunday because we came to church. They're new every morning. I suppose we could look back on our history and point out several major times when massive declines in freedom were introduced. And and America in the 60s played an enormous role in resisting authority and and jumping all over spiritual authority, especially in questioning the things that we've always known. And and rightly so, to some degree, the church had become very religious, had become very formulated, become very predictable. And and a lot of the things that 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 generation was accusing the church of were generally right. But the problem was they still missed grace. They miss this idea that God loves them and cares for them and will save them no matter what. See, legalism pushes people away from grace. And the 60s played an enormous role in that. The riots on campus, the rebellion against parents, free love, drugs, immorality was rampant. In many ways, uh, this is just a magnification of what the 60s was like today in the 2016s. The war came to the front steps of the church then. We began to take up swords to defend the church. And nowadays it's even more than ever, friends. The church is in a place where now we're having to defend the reason that we say the things that we say and believe the things that we believe without without, uh, judging someone or not being qualified to be in the diversity crowd in this world. We've become in a place where the church has become defensive anymore. We've got to stay on the defensive or, or many are just passing this by and they're just making the church so palatable without mentioning sin and calling sin sin that there's nothing left. And we have done this. This is our own fault. See, legalism wants to rise up within the flesh. It wants to be goody two-shoes. Or, or the other side is just as grand where it wants to live just like the world and come into church and expect everything's okay. And both are wrong. And God is saying, I don't want your flesh to try to do this. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want you in there. You get out of the way. Let my grace do its work. Freedom in Christ is freedom from the need of anything else in life. And our flesh does some terrible things. Our flesh will do crazy things. David came to this very point, just as we and our nation are at today. He immediately began to see what was happening because of his failures, and he felt guilty, he felt wrong. As soon as he takes a census, all of a sudden this stuff starts happening. He goes, wait a minute, I misstepped. 
I should not have done this. I have made a terrible mistake. And in verse 8, the Bible says, I have sinned greatly by doing this, he says. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. You know one thing I admire there? He talks about his guilt. How we should feel the guilt of our sin. Just because it's so prolific in culture and so announced, and we may have a certain amount of callousness toward it, doesn't mean that we should not still feel the heaviness and the weight of sin. It should disturb us. In verse 8, David was filled with guilt because he had trusted in his own strength. And how does trusting in my strength make me feel guilty? Well, it does because I'm limited. And I can only see to the end of my abilities. If I trust in my own strength, I see that my abilities eventually run out. My talent eventually doesn't go that far. My resources have an end. There's not enough of them. And all of a sudden I began to realize that because I put my own confidence on me, I can't save myself. I don't have enough resources to do it. I only wish for what God can give. And that's what David finally said. I only want what God can give. I'm so sorry that I did this. And the good news is that even though our flesh has failed, he never fails. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So David did this terrible thing and he begins to feel terrible. His flesh did this crazy thing. Our flesh cannot excuse the, uh, cannot use the excuse of freedom to do whatever we want as well. But David could have said, well, because I'm the servant of God, I'm going to do whatever I want. We can do the same thing in a way. Well, because I'm a servant of God, because I love Christ, because he has invited my life, I can live however I want to. Second Peter, or 1 Peter 1 or 2.16 says, Live as free men, but do not let your freedom... Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Galatians 5.13 You are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. In other words, we know that we're free because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And we know that he has saved us. But that's not an excuse to do and to be as we will. Some things very powerful, and I must finish up here. The battlefield is important. And we as Christians have got to run into the battlefield for the cause of freedom. Freedom is that important. David counted the men. Joab was not very happy about it. In verse 7, the Bible says the command was so evil in the sight of God that he punished Israel and they began to lose people. All kinds of horrible things began to happen. But what's so interesting about this account is the fact that God gave David three choices for his discipline. He said, you know what, David? Because you've done this terrible thing, I'm just going to give you three choices, and you can pick which one you want. Punishment through three years of famine in the land, three months of being swept away before your enemies, or three days of the sword of the Lord, the play, a plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part. Friends, God will use the battlefield of freedom to tear down our strength. Look at 1 Chronicles 21, verse 13. David said to, God, to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall in the hands of men. So the Lord sent a plague in Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as the angel was doing so, uh, but as the angel was doing so, the Lord saw it and was grieved because of the calamity. And, the, and said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand! The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth, and with a drawn sword in his hand extended over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell down, fell face down. I would too. David said to God, Was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? And I am the one who has sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? O oh Lord my God, let your hand fall upon me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. What a, really a heart after God this man has. I think I would probably feel the same way after seeing such calamity and destruction. But the battlefield definitely taught David something. It taught him that your strength is never enough. Let me tell you something, friends. Your strength is never enough. You can't do it on your own. Don't count your resources and think you can make it through you can only trust in the freedom that God has to offer. The second thing the battlefield did, it'll teach us the value of the price that Jesus paid. Reading further down in 1 Chronicles 21, verse 21, the Bible says, Then David approached, and when Aruna looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. 
David said to him, Let me have the site of your threshing floor, so I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be and the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at full price. So here he is. He's got this threshing floor. He wants to sacrifice to God. He wants to worship him and thank him for all that he's done in stopping this terrible thing. And he's going to pay the price for it, the full price. Verse 23, Aruna said to David, Take it, my lord, to king. Whatever pleases him, look, I, have, I will give you oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give you all of this. But, David, but King David replied to Aruna, I love his words. No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take... For the Lord, what is yours? Uh, or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. The King James says, I will not offer sacrifices to the Lord my God, something that costs me nothing. David understood the price of freedom. The price of freedom was his full and unconditional surrender. And our price of freedom today is the same. It's a full and unconditional surrender to the cross of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ has paid the price for you and I, friend. He has paid for all our sin and we deserve, he deserves no less than to, for us to give him all of our life. No stone left unturned. No corner of our closet hidden with the door shut that he, we think that he can't see. He needs every part. <coughs> David's willingness David's willingness to pay for the threshing floor, he knew that freedom, had, freedom didn't come cheap. Freedom really wasn't free. It came because of sacrifice. He knew the price was heavy. He was ready to meet with God because 70,000 men's voices were screaming in his mind. It was not his strength. It was not his skill as a warrior. It was not his leadership. It was not his ability to figure something out of the resources that he had accumulated. It was the intervention of the hand of God. God, help us to trust you. Help us not to begin to put our confidence in our resources or our talents or ability. Oh, I can just let this in my life because I know that I can get by with doing this. It'll be okay. I know that I can live this way without ever coming to God and fully giving him my heart. People are facing pain, relationships, struggles, marriage difficulties, and even death. Seeing my own in my own life, those that I love pass away. I had a cousin who died here just this last week of cancer, and she was a beautiful woman that loved the Lord, and it was terrible to see. She's only two years older than I was, and I am. <laughs> I was. It was sad to see, and, and I have suffered from the same fears and doubts maybe many of you have as well in life, and all of this points to the fact that when Jesus comes in, he brings a freedom that comes from nowhere else. It just comes from him. God's freedom comes to us directly at the point of our pain. You know why this account in history is so beautiful? God uses the same pain, the same place of death, and enormous sacrifice to meet with David. At the point of David's pain is where God met him. At the point of his recognition was where God met him. You know, America really doesn't deserve the freedom the Lord has to offer. None of us do. But by God's enormous grace, this is possible. America's really been blessed by the Lord. In America, the poorest among us was among the richest in the world. And although we're not the biggest population in the world, we boast 70% of the world's wealth right here in America. In America, we eat double cheeseburgers and order Diet Cokes. Actually, double cheeseburgers with extra mayo, extra bacon, and a Diet Coke. <laughs> Any one of us can hop in a car and travel across from state to state. We can take these long trips with no papers. We have great freedom. We go to ball games and eat ice cream par at ice cream parlors in America. Our wealth offers the poorest students the opportunity to go on to secondary education. America has the finest and most powerful military in the world. We are the superpower. In America, we, get, we drive Germany's best cars, eat Belgium's finest chocolate, wear India's silk shirts, and buy our Nikes from Japan, and drink Juan Valdez's coffee from Colombia. 
We export and import more food than any other nation in the world. In America, we drink water from the tap, and we drive the most extensive, best-maintained road and highway system in the world. Every home in America has electricity, running water, and sewer. Most American households have more than one vehicle, and the middle-class homes uh, come home with, uh, you come home to two or three garages. America, Americans purchase membership at health clubs because most of our jobs are no longer physically demanding enough to keep us in shape. In, Ama in America, the average blue-collar worker turns his nose up at a job that only offers $50,000 a year. We get to choose, to some degree, who our political leaders will be, and we don't have to agree with them at all. Thank God for that. While the world, uh, most of the world suffers in spiritual oppression and poverty, America was founded on the very principle of God's divine intervention in His providence. We have a religious voice that is speaking in America, promoting values and right things. Out of America's benevolence and compassion, dams are built in other countries. Food by the tons is shipped around the world, and we are still able to serve more than ourselves plenty. Most of the world's wealthiest people live in America, and there's a guy right up the street here on Washington Boulevard that, that is worth nearly $60 billion all by himself. In America, we, we, eat the, we don't eat the heel of the bread and the loaf. We purchase sliced cheese and eat more restaurants than any other people in the world. We have the best health care, the most sanitary hospitals in the world. We have the best schools in the world where students come from all over the world to study. America is the most diverse country in the world. People of different ethnicities from different cultures, different corners of the earth. In America, we understand that freedom gives us uh, what gives us, and we use we, uh, those differently from opportunity. We live together peaceably, even though some one may come from... Uh, a higher social status than the other. We, we understand that we all have the same rules and that we all have freedom. Now one is judged more better than the other just because they have more money. We have the best cell phones. We got computers in every home, televisions, two or three televisions, indoor plumbing. We are spoiled. I got to tell you, all of this stuff we proclaim and we attach it to freedom, but true freedom isn't that. True freedom is freedom found in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And when we empty our life out of our, the patheticness of the filth of our sin and our dirt that's constantly in there, and we feel that freedom of his touch, that's freedom. Amen. Isaiah 62.10. I wanted to put this scripture up there. Pass through, pass through the gates. Prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway. Remove the stones. Raise a banner for the nations. Now the banner was something important because it went before the army. The standard is what one version calls, lift up the raise the standard of the Lord, which was a banner that represented the people of, of whom were marching. We have our flags here. We've got the Christian flag and we've got the American flag. And, and this picture behind me on this, with this scripture, you know where it comes from, right? Iwo Jima and the, the popular raising of the flag, the standard, because this is now... America, this is the standard, this is the banner on which we're going to live under. I think it's time that Christians lift up the banner of the Lord. Amen. How do we do that? We live our faith out loud with boldness, unashamed. And we are willing to come to the cross of Christ consistently and proclaim our, us as unworthy and willing to take on whatever the life that God has called us to live. He's called us to this beautiful freedom, and we think we've got our plans, right? The world has its plans. And the whole time God is saying, well, wait, I've got something better. It comes in me. It's by me alone, by my grace. So let's stand and pray about this, shall we? Stand with me, and I'm just going to ask Pam if she'll come today to the piano. Let's pray about this freedom and thank God for freedom. Aren't you glad for the freedom you have in Christ? Amen. Those of you who are Christians or following Jesus, you know what that's like. There's a, there's a freedom there in the Lord. You, you understand that the heaviness, that burden of your sin is not there. That God is the one who has brought you freedom. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, so much for your grace this morning. And as we prepare to respond to you in prayer and, and change our posture, we want to pray, God, that your Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, that you touch and move in every life in this place, that every life that's here, every person that hears me today will be able to take that step toward your freedom, your freedom, God, not my plans, not my agenda, but, Lord, a life lived for you. 
And I remember as a young man, God, I had so many plans and so many things that I wanted. I wanted this, I wanted that. But Lord, you stopped me short in the call to ministry and you changed me. That same calling is here today for everyone, Lord. Maybe not to vocational ministry, but a, a calling to step out from my plans and let you take control. So move in this place, I pray, Holy Spirit. 